Hi everybody, Doug Daniel from the Pilots Online Academy. We make superior piloting simple. This is Module 9 of Phase 1. Welcome to it. These are basic maneuvers and we're going to talk about stalls today. Here's what you're going to learn. Stalls are mostly bad, but sometimes good. Why you want to become really good at detecting and recovering from stalls. What causes a stall what doesn't how to practice stalls and do it safely. Common mistakes. So let's get into causes of stalls right now. There's only one cause of a stall, boundary layer separation. There's only one situation where a boundary layer can separate and cause a stall, and that is when the wing or any other airfoil exceeds its critical, an critical angle of attack. Anything that causes the wing to exceed that critical angle, increased load, high G turns, and so forth, can be thought of as causing a stall. So here's the wing in the Cambridge Wind Tunnel. I notice the smooth flow over the upper surface. Now I'm about to increase the angle of attack. Focus on the air above and downstream of the wing. This is the burbling that signals the, an imminent stall. Watch the picture right in there. Okay, here's the burble. Show it to you again. All right. Okay, I'm going to increase the angle of attack enough to force a slow flow separation. This is going to be a stall. So once again, look right in this area here. Here we go. There it is. Because the wind is no longer curving over the upper surface, creating a partial vacuum with centrifugal force, the top surface cannot produce lift. Just the high pressure on the bottom produces any lift. Some stalls are good, but others are bad. I think I mentioned that. Without me telling you, I suspect you figured out that in straight and level flight, a stall happens when the airplane is going so slow that it cannot produce enough lift to fly because the pilot has pulled up on the nose, increasing the angle of attack until it's reached its critical angle and we get flow separation. That is the ideal condition for landing. The slower you land, the easier it is to stop. So if the wing can't lift the airplane, the brakes should be more effective. That's the good situation. Here's the bad. Suppose you are at 200 feet, turning to line up with a runway, and you stall. Well, I've been telling you that you want to lift your nose, that when you want to lift your nose, pull back on the controls. Here's the really bad news and why this lesson is so important. The worst thing you can do is what I've been telling you to do, pull back on the controls. With that motivational bit behind us, you need to practice stall detection and recovery until you don't think. You just react correctly. I couldn't resist throwing this bit in. The aviation authorities decided that it would be clever to have pilots practice stall recovery when the stall warning first sounds. I have to admit that that sounded like a really good idea when I heard it. Then Air France flying from Rio in Brazil to Charles de Gaulle in Paris crashed a new Airbus killing all on board. It was discovered after they recovered the black boxes from about 8,000 meters of, of water that the stall warning never worked and the pilot flying the airplane did not detect the stall. So we pulled back on the controls and never realized in the next 30,000 feet what he was doing. So the fundamentals of stall recovery are worth looking at. First you need to know that you're in a stall or about to be. Since the stall is caused by excessive angle of attack and the elevator is the angle of attack control, you want to push forward on the elevator control and not backward. Here's the tricky point. All airplane wings stall before their tails. This results in nose down pitching because the tail is still efficiently producing lift and the wing isn't. 
It's going to take some pretty good training for the pilot to stall at 200 feet, see that the nose is unexpectedly pointed well below the horizon, and calmly push the nose farther down. You can detect the impending stall when the stall warning sounds. If that doesn't work, the airplane will start to shudder because of this burbling I just showed you just before it stalls. And if that doesn't get your attention, you're probably going to stall. You know you've stalled because the nose suddenly pitches down without any input from you. Now's the time to start recovery procedures. Simultaneously apply full power and pitch down some. Don't overdo it, but do it right now. Almost no airplane wing stalls from the root to the trip tip all at once. They are designed to stall at the root so the stall will be less violent and to give you aileron control during recovery. You really have to work hard to stall the entire wing in a modern production airplane. If you panic and clutch the elevator control to your chest, you increase the probability that you will stall the entire wing and enter a spin. The subject of spin recovery is beyond the scope of this lesson. Sorry about that. After you have addressed the power and pitch parts of the stall recovery, the next thing is to level the wings. Within a fraction of a second, if you reacted properly, the wing should be flying normally. And you can and should start gently leveling off and climbing. Precautions before practicing stalls clearing turns. Now I'm assuming that you're at a safe altitude out in your usual practice area. Scan the airspace near, above, and below the practice area. You'll want to do two turns, one in each direction, looking above and below as well as horizontally. The turns get the wings out of your field of view. Building skill and confidence by a series of progressively more challenging stalls. Start with the easiest, simplest, safest, and least frightening stall. This builds skill, but more importantly, it builds confidence. You should know that stalls can really scare you, not because practicing is dangerous, but because the airplane with you in it can suddenly fall like a stone. After a few gentle stalls, they start to feel more like a carnival ride than a near-death experience. Panic is when pilots do foolish and dangerous things. Familiarity with stalls and repeated success certainly reduces the chance of panic. In the following slides, we progress from the least to the most challenging. Less challenging is the power off straight ahead, flaps up, stall. Pick a point on the horizon, fly directly toward it, and straighten level flight. Reduce the power to idle. Maintain constant heading and altitude as the airplane slows. You will need to slowly pitch up to compensate for the loss of lift caused by the loss of airspeed. Once you hear the Cessna stall warning sound, smoothly advance the throttle, remembering to compensate for the sudden increase in p-factor. Drop the nose slightly to accelerate more quickly, and once the stall warning silences, return to level flight until you've reached best rate of climb airspeed, and then climb. Throughout the exercise, keep the wings level and the ball centered. Next most difficult is a power off straight ahead stall with flaps. I wouldn't not really most difficult. Uh, next most exciting. Follow the same procedure as without flaps except in straight and level flight at idle airspeed, <laughs> idle power, once the airspeed indicator needle enters the white arc, deploy full flaps. And this is the white arc right in here and what the white arc means is that it's okay to put your flaps out. During stall recovery, after applying full power, retract the flaps. Don't forget to keep the wings level and the ball centered throughout the exercise. 
an approach stall. Now this stall simulates an approach and a landing that results in a stall. Set up a straight ahead idle power carb heat full flap glide at 60 knots and a 152, probably 65 and a 172. Slowly lift the nose until you stall. Apply full power and turn off the carb heat. Lower the nose to a slightly nose low attitude while retracting the flaps. I should mention that when you're applying full power and turning off the carb heat, you should be pushing forward with your right rudder pedal because the P factor is going to increase dramatically. Once the stall warning is silenced and the flaps retracted slowly without entering a secondary stall, lift the nose to a best angle of climb attitude. And don't forget to keep the wings level and the ball centered throughout the exercise. This is incredibly important and that's the reason I keep saying it. I just want to hammer it home if you'll forgive me. Departure stall. This stall simulates a runway departure when the pilot climbed too steeply. And of course this is most likely to happen when you're doing a short field landing trying to clear an obstacle. With flaps fully retracted and at full power, climb at the best angle of climb airspeed, about 60 knots. Slowly lift the nose until the stall. This is where you should be very serious about p-factor compensation because it is the maximum conceivable p-factor situation. That is if you want to avoid spin practice. Lower the nose to a slightly nose low attitude. Once the stall warning is silent, slowly, without entering a secondary stall, lift the nose to a best angle of climb attitude. If you hold it in that attitude, applying full power, the airspeed will recover to best angle of climb airspeed and you'll climb at best angle of climb. And don't forget to keep the wings level and the ball centered throughout the exercise. Things to guard against. Well, you probably guessed what number one on my list is. Letting the airplane become cross-controlled, meaning the ball not centered. This is probably the most common mistake that pilots make in any flying situation. And let me just throw out an aside. I was the president of a 10 airplane flying club when one of the members took off with his wife and two children on board and was driving his car instead of flying his airplane and got the airplane radically cross control, stalled, spun, crashed, killed everybody on board. It was such a a stupid and avoidable mistake that I've become passionate about keeping the ball in the center. Okay, push the nose too far down. This results in unnecessary attitude loss. Loss. It's easy to do because you want to fix the situation as quickly as possible, but don't just shove it all the way forward and leave it there. Trying to pull out too fast, this can result in another stall called a secondary stall. So do your pull out gently and after the stall warning has quit sounding. So here's what you've learned. Stalls are mostly bad, but sometimes good. While well, you want to become really good at detecting and recovering from stalls, what causes a stall, what doesn't, and how to practice stalls and to practice them safely, and some common mistakes. So next, we're going into ground track maneuvers, meaning turns around a point, S-turns, and rectangular patterns. These exercises are valuable because they teach first compensating for the wind and also a, a way of learning what the wind is really doing and dividing your attention between outside and inside the cockpit, a very important skill to develop, and skills that you need in the airport traffic area, meaning skills that will help you land better. So thank you very much for your attention uh, and uh, we'll talk again later. I'm going to leave this up long enough for you to read all the fine print. So thank you very much and talk later.